Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this lecture video, I'm going to be discussing hemoglobin. All right, let's get started. So what is hemoglobin? It's a protein uh, that is primarily responsible for transporting oxygen from the lungs to various tissues within the body. Body tissues and organs require oxygen in order to survive. Hemoglobin also transports carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs. 90% of the dry weight of every red blood cell consists of hemoglobin, and around 33% or around one third of the volume of the red blood cell is composed of hemoglobin. Now hemoglobin is produced as early as the pronormoblast stage. If you have not already checked out my erythrocyte lecture, I encourage you to do so uh, to understand the erythrocyte developmental stages. So as a quick review here, the pronormoblast stage is the first recognizable precursor to the erythrocyte. Then it becomes a basophilic normoblast, then polychromatic normoblast, then orthochromic normoblast, then polychromatic erythrocyte, then the mature erythrocyte. So hemoglobin starts being produced in the cell at that pronormoblast stage, so the first cell in that lineage. And 65% of the total amount of hemoglobin in the red blood cell is already produced by the time that the cell's nucleus is expelled from it. So remember, mature red blood cells do not have a nucleus. It, get, uh, it actually gets expelled in between the orthochromic uh, normoblast and polychromatic erythrocyte stages. So now that we know what hemoglobin is, how do we test for it in the clinical laboratory? Hemoglobin is part of the complete blood count, or CBC. It's run on an EDTA tube, so a lavender tube, uh, which recall cannot be clotted. If it's clotted, you have to um, submit for a redraw. Uh, results are produced by an automated CBC analyzer. Normal reference ranges for hemoglobin differ slightly between each biological sex. For biologic adult males, hemoglobin should be 14 to 17.4 grams per deciliter, and for biological adult females, hemoglobin should be 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. Adult biological males tend to have uh, higher hemoglobin values uh, due to their sex hormones having a stimulatory effect on erythropoiesis, uh, which is the production of red blood cells. Hemoglobin is, of course, comprised of heme and also globin. Heme is produced in the mitochondria. It then leaves the mitochondria and combines with globin to form hemoglobin. The structure of hemoglobin is nearly spherical. This uh, on the right hand side here is a gray diagram showing what the molecule looks like. So there are four globin chains which are held together by salt bonds, hydrophobic contacts, and hydrogen bonds. So here are the globin chains. So here's one, two, three, and four. So those are the globin chains that I'm talking about. Um, now each of these chains is the heme which are these little yellow circles here and in between, in, in nestled in uh, these globin chains. Um, and you can see here this little green dot in the center of those yellow circles um, represents the iron in each heme molecule. Now the iron binds to oxygen. When it's bound to oxygen, uh, hemoglobin is called oxyhemoglobin. When oxygen is not attached or not bound to this molecule, it's called deoxyhemoglobin. So these globin chains fold, enabling uh, the heme to be in a hydrophobic pocket there in the center. Now, of course, um, the, every uh, hemoglobin molecule has those four globin chains with that heme nestled inside, and that heme carries that one molecule of oxygen. So each hemoglobin molecule has two different pairs of globin chains and four heme groups. And in normal adult human, there are four types of globin chains, and these occur in pairs. So these are alpha chains, beta chains, delta chains, and gamma chains. And we'll discuss the significance of those on the next slide here. So four chain types in normal adult humans, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. And these combine together to form different types of hemoglobins. So hemoglobin A, also called hemoglobin A1, is composed of two alpha and two beta chains. So this is pictured in this diagram. So you see the two alphas, here's an alpha, here's an alpha, 
here's a beta, here's a beta. So two betas and two alpha. So this is a hemoglobin A or hemoglobin uh, A1 uh, molecule. So this is um, this hemoglobin type is the main type of hemoglobin present in a normal adult human. So around 95% of all the hemoglobin present. Hemoglobin A2 is composed of two alpha chains and two delta chains. This comprises less than 3% of the total amount of hemoglobin that is present in a normal human adult. And then hemoglobin F, also called fetal hemoglobin, is composed of two alpha chains and two gamma chains. Normal human adults have around 1 to 2% of the total amount of their hemoglobin as fetal hemoglobin. Because iron, protoporphyrins, and globins are part of the making of hemoglobin, it makes sense that all these things need to be present in order for normal hemoglobin to be produced. So once we start talking uh, in upcoming lectures about hemoglobinopathies and thalassemias and some anemias, this really becomes important. There are some times when adequate iron isn't available or protoporphyrins or globin chains are not produced or produced in lesser amounts, and this leads to issues. You don't have to worry about it just now, all right? Um, but once we start talking about certain anemias and hemoglobinopathies and thalassemias, um, that's when uh, it becomes important. Now, transferrin is the transport mechanism of iron. So it delivers iron three and then it converts it to iron two and it inserts into the protoporphyrin ring in the heme molecule. Now, when iron enters a cell, it can either be used for the synthesis of heme or it can go into a storage pool in the form of ferritin uh, and hemosiderin. All right, so the development of hemoglobin. So the, the first phase of, of the fetal development of blood cells is called the mesoblastic phase or the mesoblastic phase. So this begins as early as 19 days after fertilization. Now we're talking in utero, all right? So when the fetus is in the uterus. Um, so it's called um, mesoblastic or mesoblastic because this is the phase where cells are formed outside of the embryo and the in the mesenchyme of the yolk sac. So the yolk sac is a structure that develops and provides an embryo with nourishment and circulates gases between the mother and that embryo. The yolk sac also produces cells that turn into important structures in addition to blood cells. It also produces what eventually becomes the umbilical cord and reproductive organs. So it has a lining of mesoderm, and this is where the fetal blood cell development takes place. Now remember in adults, the hemoglobins are A or A1, A2, and F. The fetus has different kinds of hemoglobin. So in this stage, hemoglobin Gower 1, hemoglobin Gower 2, and hemoglobin Portland are produced. Gower 1 is composed of two zeta globin chains and two epsilon globin chains. Gower 2 is composed of two alpha chains and two epsilon chains. And Portland is composed of two zeta and two gamma chains. And the fetus also has hemoglobin F. Um, so after the birth of the fetus, the fetal hemoglobin or hemoglobin F persists for a short time and adults have about 1 to 2 percent of it uh, normally. Hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin is the predominant hemoglobin present in the fetus uh, formed during the liver and bone marrow erythropoiesis part of development. Um, and of course, uh, like we discussed on the, on the last slide, it's made up of two alpha and two gamma chains. Uh, it isn't about until about 36 weeks of gestation in utero that beta chains begin to develop, which are used um, then used to create the main adult hemoglobin, which is hemoglobin A or A1. So why is hemoglobin so important? It exists to transport and exchange respiratory gases. It transports oxygen to be released into the tissues, and then of course carbon dioxide is removed from those tissues. When discussing hemoglobin, the term oxygen affinity comes up frequently. So this is the ability of the hemoglobin to bind and release oxygen. If it has a higher affinity, this means that there is a lesser need for oxygen in the tissues and the hemoglobin holds onto the oxygen. When it has a lower affinity, this means that there is a more need for oxygen in the tissues and the hemoglobin more readily lets go of the oxygen molecule to be released into those tissues that need it. If hemoglobin has a higher affinity, this means that there's a lesser need for oxygen in those tissues and that hemoglobin holds on to that oxygen. So this happens when there is alkalosis, so the pH of the uh, blood increases. 
Also, it occurs when a patient has a blood transfusion or decreased body temperature. A hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin has a higher oxygen affinity just by, by default. And also if the patient has a decreased 2,3 DPG. So 2,3 DPG binds to hemoglobin and decreases the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So if the patient has a decreased amount of 2,3 DPG, it's gonna have a higher affinity for oxygen. When hemoglobin has a lower affinity, this means that there is more need for oxygen in the tissues and the hemoglobin lets go of the oxygen molecule to be released into those tissues. So this occurs when there's acidosis, meaning a decrease of the pH of the blood. Increased 2,3 DPG levels also have an, um, and also a increased body temperature in the patient. Certain hemoglobin variants have a lower affinity in general. Um, and patients that have coronary heart disease and anemia, their body needs more oxygen in the tissue. So the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin is gonna be lowered so that it can release that oxygen into the tissues. There is something called the Bohr effect. So this effect describes how pH affects the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin. As hydrogen concentration in the tissues increase, the affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin decreases, allowing oxygen to be more readily released into the tissues. So in short, that just seems like a lot, a lot of words there. So basically in short here, what this is saying is that an increased pH in the blood is going to cause an increased oxygen affin affinity, and a decreased pH in the blood is going to cause a decreased oxygen affinity. Now there are three different mechanisms of how carbon dioxide is transported. Dissolution in the plasma, formation of bicarbonic acid, and binding of the N-terminus group of hemoglobin. So let's just really br briefly discuss those here. So obviously we use oxygen. We don't want carbon dioxide. Our bodies want to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So a small amount of carbon dioxide is dissolved in the plasma and then carried to the lungs. It's here that it's expired out of the body. Most carbon dioxide is transported in bicarbonic acid. Um, they then diffuse from the plasma into the red blood cell. 23%-ish of the total carbon dioxide that is exchanged by the red blood cell in the body's respiration through carb amino hemoglobin. Uh, carbo carbon dioxide binds to the end terminus of the globin chains of the hemoglobin molecule, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide decreases and then the carbon dioxide that was bound is then released and then diffuses into the plasma. There are some non-functional hemoglobins. This occurs when the hemoglobin is unable to transport oxygen or can't deliver oxygen. Hypoxia and cyanosis develop. So hypoxia is when there is not enough oxygen to sustain bodily functions. And cyanosis is when there is a bluish or grayish color of the skin due to lack of oxygen. Uh, these non-functional hemoglobins are called methemoglobin, sulfhemoglobin, and carboxyhemoglobin. We're gonna talk about all three of them. Methemoglobin is the first non-functional hemoglobin that we're going to discuss. So there's an enzyme called NADH methemoglobin reductase enzyme, which reduces methemoglobin to hemoglobin. So it breaks down methemoglobin into hemoglobin. Methemoglobin is a hemoglobin that has been oxidized from the iron two to the iron three, and this prevents it from binding to oxygen. Um, so if it can't bind oxygen, that's a problem, right? So absolutely. So methemoglobinemia occurs when there is not enough of that enzyme being produced to reduce the methemoglobin to usable hemoglobin, or if there's too much methemoglobin being produced. Uh, so this can be caused by ingesting drugs or uh, drinking too much water with nitrates present. Uh, this unfortunately does cause cyanosis to develop. A normal human should have less than 1% methemoglobin present. It becomes toxic at 1.5 grams per deciliter in the blood. Uh, this can be re uh, reversed by ingesting reducing agents such as methylene blue or exorbic acid. Once levels of methemoglobin uh, reach 10%, so that means 10% of all the hemoglobin that's present within the body, a cyanosis develops and the patient must ingest a reducing agent at that point. The next one is sulfhemoglobin. So this is a rare and abnormal form of hemoglobin that cannot carry oxygen. 
This occurs when there is an increase of sulfur and the sulfur combines with the heme groups. And of course, if it's binding with the heme, this prevents the, the heme from binding with the iron. So this causes the blood um, actually to be green in color. If three to 4% of hemoglobin is sulf hemoglobin, this is when cyanosis develops. Unfortunately, it's irreversible. So causes for this sulf hemoglobin to develop in the first place um, include severe constipation, uh, severe bacterial infections with clostridium, um, or taking sulfonamides, which are a type of sulfur-containing antibiotic. All right, so carboxyhemoglobin is the last non-functional hemoglobin we're going to talk about. Uh, this develops when hemoglobin is exposed to carbon monoxide. Hemoglobin just really, really, really loves carbon monoxide. Uh, it would much rather bind to carbon monoxide than to oxygen. So it has a high affinity for it. So in the presence of carbon monoxide, uh, carboxyhemoglobin is going to form. So this causes a cherry red color to both the blood and the skin. Once levels of carboxyhemoglobin reach 50% or greater, meaning 50% of all hemoglobin total in the body, the patient dies. Smokers generally have anywhere from 4 to 20% of carboxyhemoglobin present within their bloodstream. Uh, working in polluted areas like in automotives or industry jobs have an increased risk of developing carboxyhemoglobin. And uh, hyperbaric chamber therapy can help reduce the amount of carboxyhemoglobin present. All right, so that's it for this lecture on hemoglobin. If you uh, enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a like. And if you have any questions for me, go ahead and leave those in the comments. I'll be happy to answer your question. Um, and as always, um, if you like this uh, video, please subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. Until next time.